Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to round five coverage of my games from the 2017 Pacific Southwest Open. Um, so round five is the final round, the bunny round in this case, because um, I was on one of the top three boards. Um, and all six of us, the six players on the top three boards in this section, were in contention for a share of the prize bunny. Prizes were being handled out, handed out to uh, players that finish in first through fourth places. So of the six players on those three boards, uh, there was one player that was at three and a half points out of four. There were two players that had uh, three points out of four. And the rest of us, the other three, had uh, two and a half points out of four. So I and my opponent both had two and a half points out of four in the tournament at this stage. Um, the two players that had three points out of four, by the way, were the uh, two kids that I played in rounds uh, two and round three. So uh, they were both doing well in this tournament. Uh, the one I beat had won uh, all his other games, and then the other player who uh, I lost to uh, must have uh, had a loss somewhere along the lines. Anyway, um, uh, my opponent, like I said, was at two and a half. Um, she had a rating of 1794, and my rating was 1763, and she was also one of the kids. So on the top uh, three boards, there were uh, two grown-ups. Actually, the player at uh, three and a half was one of the adults. So there were two adults and four kids. <laughs> so uh, anyway, my opponent started off with e4. <clears throat> I went c5. She went knight f3. So I think we're going for a normal uh, kind of open Sicilian. And I go e6. That's uh, my choice these days when I'm playing a strong player and I go for the Sicilian. I'm often playing with e6 and trying to get into less trodden lines. Um, I, I seem to get into some trouble when I play the d6 move these days, uh, particularly against uh, strong players. So is often the way I play now. Um, and she went c3 here. So this move surprised me because this uh, transposes into the Alapen Sicilian. So this is, um, you could think of this as a delayed Alapen. Normally this c3 move is played on move two. And in those, in that case, uh, these moves would not have been played. Um, <clears throat> so the normal response to the Alapen is to try and put pressure on the undefended e-pawn because the, uh, the c3 pawn is blocking the natural development of the knight to defend that pawn. And the two ways of doing that are either knight f6 or d5. And both of those uh, work in this position. Um, I played knight f6, but uh, there is a wrinkle in the d5 option. After d5, um, black, uh, white normally takes. And um, well, the wrinkle is that because of this um, pawn to e6 having been played in knight f3, um, there's another option for black here that doesn't exist in the normal Alapen Sicilian. So black can take. And the chess engine and the opening book both like this line, actually. d4, knight f6. It looks a little bit shaky to me. I'm not entirely sure I would play this way. But I guess the idea is that if white gives black the isolated queen's pawn, black gets uh, that bishop developed quickly. And, uh, well, certainly black's pieces will have um, a lot of activity. And uh, so there'll be compensation for the isolated queen's pawn there. Um, of course, you can still take with the queen as in a normal Alapen Sicilian, relying on the fact that the c3 pawn is once again blocking the knight from coming out and harassing the queen. And after d4, play knight of six. And this is a normal position in the Alapen Sicilian as well. Anyway, I went with the other way of playing it with knight to f6. And I'm doing okay so far. Let's see. So this is attacking the pawn, and with no good defense, the pawn comes forward. It's all part of the plan. And then the knight hops into d5, which is a, a good square, and uh, black plays d4. Uh, but right here I make a mistake. <clears throat> Maybe I was a little bit confused because, you know, I've been in this position before, but not, not with these... Uh, not with the knight here and the pawn here. And uh, sometimes I've played against the delayed Sicilian where I had the move um, d6 in, not the move e6. So imagine this pawn back on e7 and this pawn forward on d6. And I'm already putting pressure on the center here. It's it's slightly different. Um, but uh, anyway, the main move here and what I should have played is c takes d4. And then I can play uh, d6. Just starting to put pressure on the center. It's bishop c4 knight c6, and uh, this may look a little bit funny, but the pressure of the bishop on the knight, uh, the threat to exchange it and double the pawns here is not a big deal because uh, because of the tension here in the center. Those pawns will get undoubled pretty quickly. 
So uh, this is all fine. Uh, white castles and black goes bishop e7. And this, this is how I should have played it, gotten to a position like this. Instead of taking first, I played knight to c6 immediately. I must have been playing too fast at this point because um, <clears throat> as I was waiting for my opponent's response, <laughs> I realized that uh, c4 here would be a pretty good move for white. And, um, and um, yeah, let's just show that line. If she played c4 here, um, this knight doesn't have so many great squares to go to. Knight e7 is a chess engine recommendation. And then the pawn can push forward to d5. And now uh, this knight has no nowhere good to go. And going to d4 actually uh, loses a pawn. Um, so that's not so great. Although maybe maybe black gets some activity, so there's a little bit of compensation, but the black is down a pawn, basically. Um, or uh, let's see, the knight moves uh, right away. There's another there's another option here after knight d4 rather than uh, taking is actually to push on with d6, which is uh, something that looks pretty annoying as well. Although chess engine rates this as even for black because I guess I've defended the knight and I'm not losing material, but uh, that would be pretty hard to play against this kind of uh, setup, I think, with those, with those white pawns all the way down here. Uh, so anyway, c4 would have been a good move in this position. Um, instead, my opponent, who was taking her time and thinking about these moves, um, she played bishop e2. I'm not sure if she thought about that or was thinking about other things, or maybe she saw something there she didn't like. Um, anyway, so now I took, and I'm back to okay here. So is it back? To, we sort of transpose back to a normal position, and I get in d6. So we saw this kind of position already in some of the other lines, and this is <clears throat> typically what you go for in this line against the Alapin Sicilian, something very much like this. Usually this bishop is a little more active, though, out here on, uh, on c4 or b5. <clears throat> anyway, um, at this point she decided to take. Maybe not the best choice. It does leave white with an isolated pawn there. Um, chess engine's recommending castling, castling, and uh, bishop e7. And yeah, like I said, this seems like a fine position. He takes d6 is also okay. It just helps me a little bit. Helps me get my bishop off the back rank so I can castle, and it does leave white with a isolated pawn, so I have a target. So it gives me some ideas here. Uh, white is still okay here, though. It's, it's probably about even. Let's see. She continues with knight c3. I went uh, bishop b4. This was uh, a choice. I mean, I didn't have to play that move. I could have moved my knight, or I could even have left it there and allowed the exchange. And, uh, well, you can question whether I should be moving this bishop again so soon. But it does um, open the d file for my queen, so it gives my queen a little more scope on the d file. And uh, it puts pressure on this knight, so it provokes uh, a reaction here. Uh, bishop to d2. So I think it's a good choice, even though it's kind of violating that rule about moving a piece twice at the end game. But I'm improving that piece with the tempo. I'm improving the position of it with tempo. So I think that was a good choice. Let's see. Um, then I castled here. White castled. So that, you know, I was able to uh, get my bishop off the back rank and castle. And um, then I go b6 to preparing to develop my last piece. She goes a3, kicking the bishop, and now the bishop has sort of done its job, so I drop it back to e7, which I think is also a good move, even though it's, it's I haven't finished developing and I've moved this piece three times. It's on a good square. This is a good piece in this structure, looking out on two diagonals through the open, open lines in the pawn structure. Um, and this bishop is going to get developed, so I'm not falling too far behind. So I think this is a good choice. Um, and the, the chess engine likes it okay, too. Let's see. She went bishop c4 here, putting a little pressure on the knight. And I decide to um, trade here. I don't have to. Once again, I could allow um, I could allow white to trade. I'd have to take back with a pawn, and we would have this uh, ram structure in the center, which um, is, that, that should be an okay version of the ram structure for me, but um, nothing. It should be pretty even. And um, <clears throat> so I was going for a little bit of imbalance by trading here. I'm giving... Uh, white a choice. White can either go for b takes uh, c3, take with a pawn and have the uh, hanging pawns, or take with the bishop and have a isolated pawn here. So she chose to go for the hanging pawns. I think that's a good choice here. Um, the c pawn 
you know, I'm going to try and get some pressure against it, but at the moment it's uh, defending the deep pawn and uh, controlling some useful squares on the queen side. So um, not a bad way to play. I go bishop b7, finally, and developing my bishop. She goes rook e1. Um, maybe thinking to get in this d5 push, which would be uh, interesting for white. Um, maybe it doesn't work just yet, but anyway, starting to put some pressure on the e-file. So I play bishop to f6, get the bishop off the e-file, and at the same time, uh, you know, put some pressure on this diagonal, try and freeze these pawns, make it more difficult for them to come forward. So, um, so far, uh, I think this is all okay for either side, but I think I, I'm playing reasonably well, except for that, that one uh, blunder earlier on, on like move five. Uh, let's see. So I go, um, ah, it's white's turn. White goes queen e2. Go rook c8. And um, white goes bishop a6. So this really is the first mistake. Maybe um, even queen e8, queen e2 is a little bit of a uh, misstep because it was part of this plan, queen e2 and bishop a6. And um, maybe white should have a different plan. Um, something like rick to b1 and pushing these queens, queen pawns forward. Queen side pawns forward might be a way to continue. Uh, but this trade helps me, actually. So um, this is how the game went. She put the queen on e2 so that she could play bishop a6 and uh, trade off the light squared bishop. But after this, actually, black has an advantage. So it's been um, even an even game so far with that. You know, white having a typical opening advantage and, you know, black equalizing. Except for that one misstep where I uh, didn't, didn't, uh, I allowed that c4 push um, that she didn't play. But from this point, well, starting at this point anyway, um, I have an advantage. And the thing is, the uh, that bishop was controlling some key squares over here. Now I can look at this c4 square as a place to put my knight. Um, this bishop is... Uh, you know, kind of hemmed in behind the pawns. And uh, as long as I can keep the pressure on those pawns and keep them from moving forward, um, I can try and make that, that bishop not a particularly useful piece. So uh, that's a good position for uh, for black. I played queen c7 here. This is um, defending the a pawn and preparing to move the knight. Um, also uh, looking at the c pawn with pressure. Um, she dropped her queen back to e2. I played knight to a5, heading for that c4 square. Now she goes rook to b1. She actually uh, moved the e rook to b1, which I think is kind of interesting. But, uh, well, there's an idea here. I go knight c4, and she goes rook b3. So I think maybe the idea is to uh, potentially double <clears throat> double on the um, uh, b file and, and try and undermine my pawns here. But in any case, this, this rook on b3 securely defends the c pawn. So um, after knight c4, rook b3, I didn't really think too hard about taking this uh, bishop. I think this is a piece I want to keep on the board and just play against it. So I moved uh, my rook to d8, just uh, lining up all my pieces. So I've got this ideal configuration against the uh, these hanging pawns here. I've got the two rooks on the c and the d file. I've got them blockaded by a knight, and I've got pressure on them from the bishop. So I'm, I'm very happy with this position. Um, she decided at this point to um, keep her bishop, not allow me to trade it off by playing bishop e1. Um, the chess engine likes h3 here. It doesn't really care so much that uh, I can take the bishop. And after knight takes, queen takes, thinks, um, you know, white is, white is doing okay here. Um, I probably wouldn't even take there after h3. I'd probably look for some other move to play in this position. Um, because, like I said, I want to get this, keep this uh, bishop on the board and try and play against it, make it, make it uh, less less useful. You know, I could try and get pressure against the a pawn, but uh, that's pretty securely defended with the two rooks. Yeah, so I'd have to search around for a plan at this point. Um, but anyway, she went um, bishop to uh, e1, and. Um, at I saw an opportunity here to uh, change the pawn structure again, and I went for it. I played the move uh, e5. And I'm playing this at a point when um, white can't push the pawn forward. I can just grab with the rook. I guess e5 is a plan I could have followed even if, uh, if white had played h3. So I could have gone forward with the same kind of plan. Um, and uh, 
if she doesn't take the pawn, then I can take, and you know she'll either take back with the knight or the pawn. But either way, she'll be left with an isolated pawn that I can play against. So I'm transforming the uh, the hanging pawns back back into an isolated pawn again. Um, so she took with the pawn, and um, I took back. And we just uh, kept trading till we get to this position. And it would have been the same if she had taken with the knight. I would have also just traded and uh, gotten the pawn back. And so now there's this isolated C pawn that I have uh, a lot of pressure against. Although I can't actually uh, take it just yet. So uh, she thought about this for a long time and played the move uh, G3. Yeah, the problem with taking it is I just get uh, pinned. And I don't have any good... Uh, good uh, uh, tempo moves to unpin the bishop. So it looks like I actually wind up in trouble in a line like that. So um, so I just played g6. So we're in the position, well, phase of the game where uh, I've got an advantage in that um, this bishop is passive and these pawns are weaker than my pawns. But I don't have a, a clear plan anymore. I have to kind of poke and prod and uh, look for ways to try and uh, induce uh, further weaknesses. Um, let's see, she played rook d1. This, maybe this helps me a little bit. I think uh, as we get closer to an endgame, these pawns become weaker, so probably white should keep the material on. But anyway, I went ahead and traded and then went uh, queen to c6. One of the reasons why she might have been trading is that uh, she'd been taking her time on every move uh, up to this point and uh, was starting to run low on time. And as I mentioned uh, in an earlier video, this is a uh, game in 90, but with a 30 second increment. And she might have uh, already been down to the 30 second increment. So she'd make uh, a few quick moves to gain some time and then she'd have a minute or two to think. Um, and uh, well, it's, it's tough in a position like this where, you, um, you know, I, I didn't have a clear plan, but white doesn't have a clear plan either. And, the, and the, since the trades, don't help. I mean, trades are easy things to uh, calculate when you're low on time, and so sometimes that's why you go for that, but it's not uh, not uh, really helpful in the position. Anyway, uh, let's see. White went uh, queen d3 here, and I went queen e6. Like I said, I don't really have a clear plan, but I'm you know, just trying to poke around and find weaknesses. I'm hitting the rook over here in this case, uh, which has to be defended. So the queen dropped back to d1. I went with f6 of the queen, thinking maybe I can range uh, to take the pawn this way. She goes back to d3 with the queen, so I suppose she would probably... I think she did offer a draw at some point uh, during this game, so she might be happy with the draw already at this point. Um, but uh, anyway, I was playing on. I went rook d8. I have the advantage, and uh, I can play on without much risk, so that's the thing to do, to keep poking and prodding and trying to find a way to convert these weaknesses into uh, something tangible. So rook d8 hitting the queen. Queen dropped back to c2. Went queen to um, e6. Cancel that queen to e6. Looking at the rook again. Also uh, looking at the bishop. So I'm threatening maybe to take uh, there with... Um, does that work? No, that doesn't work. Maybe taking here uh, with the, the idea of taking the bishop with check. Uh, let's see. So she dropped her rook back to b1, defending the bishop. And I played rook to d5, trying to activate my rook. Um, this is a bit risky, <laughs> I have to uh, admit, leaving the back rank clear. Um, my bishop, though, at the moment is covering this diagonal, and there's no s simple move that gets uh, white to the back rank, but it is taking some chances. But I feel, felt like I had to activate to try and you know, get some more pressure against, uh, against uh, white's setup here. Um, the chess engine, by the way, likes the move bishop to f6, but I don't, I don't actually believe this. I mean, uh, so bishop f6, the chess engine gives this line, rook d1, and uh, rook takes, queen takes. I mean, I think uh, white's being very cooperative in that line, so I don't know if white would really play like that. Um, and then h5. But, uh, well, the reason why I showed you this computer line is because this h5 move is actually a good move that uh, something maybe I should have thought about you know, when you're looking for moves and you don't have a clear plan, sometimes just improving your position a little bit is the way to go. And this h5 move uh, improves the position by giving the king another uh, square. For example, if you imagine white activating her bishop and getting it over here and maybe threatening on the back rank, if I have this 
option of coming to uh, h7 with my king to chase the bishop away. Uh, you know, I'm just in better shape here. And I'm not, um, I'm not creating any new weaknesses. I'm already weak on the dark squares here. So this doesn't create any new weaknesses. And, uh, <clears throat> well, maybe this, uh, maybe the g6 pawn is a little bit weaker because it has one less defender, but uh, white no longer has any pieces left to sacrifice on g6. So anyway, this is a good example of a, a kind of a quiet strengthening move, a strengthening move, as uh, Chess Explained would call it, that would uh, uh, just improve my position a little bit. Anyway, this is where I played rip to d5, and uh, she went bishop to d2. And uh, this overlooks a tactic, so if you want to uh, spot the tactic here, Okay, yeah, pause the video if you want time to think about it. I'm going to give the answer away. I went ahead and played the tactic. I played the move queen to d6, and it's a double attack. I'm attacking the bishop, and I'm attacking the pawn. So um, the other way to think about this is that, uh, <clears throat> you know, black is, or white, white is finally activating that bishop at the cost of a pawn. Sometimes that's the best way to get to a drawn position rather than suffering <laughs> rather than suffering with equal material but all your pieces passive you know give up a pawn and activate your pieces and try and uh, play on that way um, <laughs> the chess engine though actually thinks that's a mistake and says i should just continue with a move like queen to c6 just kind of uh, continuing my policy of waiting around <laughs> uh, so it's interesting so what's wrong with queen d6 well, it has to do with um, with this bishop. The the um, bishop can come here to h6 and start to, uh, well, take squares away from my king. And now notice that this is a point where I really wish I had played h5. <laughs> so, uh, and it's not safe for me to take the pawn here. I guess this is a key point. If I take, then um, queen to e4. The queen comes out, hits these two undefended pieces, um, the only way to hold things together is to play queen a5, and yeah, my whole situation is getting kind of fragile. Um, <clears throat> black can increase the pressure with rook e1, and let's see, the chess engine gives f5 as a way to try and kick the queen away and unravel, but it's uh, it's uh, you know not a move I wanted to play. It's opening up another line against my king, but if I don't play that move, you know, how can I ever... <laughs> this, this bishop is permanently... Uh, trapped here and it's uh, because the, of the mate threat on the back rank. My pieces aren't getting to the back rank fast enough to defend and, uh, and white is about to play f4 to win that piece. Um, so I had to do something drastic here. So f5 is a move. And apparently, uh, well, white is better, but uh, black can play on in this position. But anyway, that would be a big turn of events. Actually, after bishop to h6, the best move is not to grab the pawn, but to play just bishop back to g7 defend the back rank and just play on from here. It's still trying to go after these weaknesses, but the chess engine says this is all pretty equal. So, um, well, my opponent, though, was uh, in time trouble, as I mentioned, so she was uh, having to make these moves uh, pretty quickly and probably had planned a few moves out in advance. She went with uh, bishop to e3, and I took on a3. But she, she noticed that uh, that was a double attack. She paused to look for things, and that was what she came up with. And, um, and then she came in, uh, she played the move c4 here, hitting my uh, rook. So <clears throat> um, so I finally, after a lot of maneuvering and stuff, uh, got into a position where I've got some material edge. And uh, well, this is a long game, so I'm going to go through the next few moves quickly. There's just some, uh, it's kind of another maneuvering phase. And I offer these trades. I, I just want to go into an end game. And uh, at first, uh, she declined the trade, but then uh, in this position here, she offered the queen trade again. I think that's what happens once again when you're low on time. I'm, I've got the extra pawn. I can make threats. I can eventually push this pawn forward uh, when I get everything arranged. So, um, you know, if, if white is looking for some active plan and some way to distract me from pushing those pawns forward, sometimes offering trades is the way to do it. But anyway, I'm happy to trade into this end game, and um, so we go like this. I go bishop c5, and she continues to trade. So yeah, yeah. I guess that's the other thing. Maybe she felt it would be easier to figure things out with a simplified board position and being out of uh, basically out of time. Um, so she went rick, e, rick a2 here, attacking my pawn. 
So this is a, a Rick and Pawn endgame where I'm a pawn up. And I think it should be winning because there are pawns on both sides of the board. It's, uh, if all the pawns are on one side, then it's often very drawish. But uh, there are ideas here to play off one side against the other. And that's um, usually how you can find a way to win these games. So I think I played this part pretty well. Let's see, I dropped back my rook back to c7. You don't want to be in a hurry to push things forward. Um, let's see, the rook went to a4, defending. I uh, played f5 so I can bring my king out. And the king's march to the center and um, king to d4. So I just need um, to uh, use some Tsugsvang moves to, uh, to force the king back. I want to get my king into this square. Um, so I play a5 now. This takes a square away from the uh, rook. So the rook has no moves uh, along, the, the, uh, <clears throat> along the file. Let's see, if the rook drops back, um, you know, I also have this idea of rook here to here to chase the king back. So I think I, I'll be able to chase the king back one way or another. Um, she moved back voluntarily at this point, king d3, and I went to king c5. So I got my king to the ideal position. Uh, the rook went back to a2, defending against invasions here. I went to check, king to c3, and rook to d4. So now I'm piling up on this pawn, threatening to win it. So the rook came back to uh, a4. And, um, well, I came up with an idea here. I, I, chess engine, well, I, I guess it, if it wins, it's an okay move. <laughs> it was not the first choice of the chess engine, but I think it uh, uh, simplifies the position and leads to a win. So uh, if you want to look for a move for black in this position, uh, what would you play here? Okay, uh, the move I played was um, b5. And um, I'm just going to get into a winning king and pawn endgame after this. Um, the rook can take on a5. Maybe that's why it's not technically the best move. I take here with check. And, um, and notice that the rook has no, no squares. So if the king just moves away, she moved to b3, which I think is probably the right idea. But if the king went to the other way, so the king went here, I'm just going to play my rook to a5. And that's going to force um, a trade of rooks because this rook has no nowhere to go. Um, so that gets me to that winning king and pawn endgame. She played the toughest defense here with king b3. Went uh, rook, cancel that. I went to rook b4 check. Once again, uh, giving the king a choice of which way to go. And if uh, the king goes this way, my rook is going to uh, a4 and force a trade. So she went to uh, a3. And then I played uh, rook a4 check anyway because it's still a winning king and pawn endgame. That's often the idea with the king and pawn endgames. So you give up that pawn in order to get a better king position and win on the other side of the board. That's also why pawns on both sides of the board is very important in these rook and pawn endgames. So rook takes, pawn takes, king takes, and that is just a winning king and pawn endgame. Let's go ahead and go through it. There's actually two choices here. So maybe I'll, one, one more comment. Um, you know, obviously my plan is just to run over here and take these pawns. Um, and uh, white can follow me like she did in this game, or white can try and go this way and take take my pawns. Um, but if white chooses to take my pawns, you have to calculate this out before you go into the king and pawn endgame. Um, but it's not too hard to calculate. You just have to make sure you get here. You get to this square where you're... Uh, cancel that. You get to this square where you're in front of the pawn and defending it before white has a chance to uh, take uh, take that pawn. And that's just a win. So that, that line is hopeless. And uh, so she tried the other line, um, following my king over and trying to uh, squeeze it a little bit. But, uh, well, this doesn't work. Although it was handy at this point. <laughs> I was saying earlier how h5 was a, was a good move in that uh, position with uh, you know the queens and the rooks and the bishops were still on because it gave a... Uh, Gave an extra square for the king and kept the bishop out of uh, h6. But right now, I'm glad this pawn is back on uh, h7 because this gives me a tempo here in this position. Uh, might be a little more difficult if this pawn were all the way forward. Eh, it's probably still a win. Uh, but anyway, this makes the win easier. This, I can play this move to um, create a Tsugsvang and force the king back. 
and then I get to this good square. King went to g2, and now I just push the h-pawn through. And, uh, well, whichever way the king goes, I'm going to continue to h4. And the idea is that uh, if white takes this way, I take, and then I'm also winning the other pawn because this king is in the wrong spot to uh, to protect either of those pawns. And uh, but if the king had gone, uh, the king had gone the other way and was on this side, I would still play this way. And after taking, I would take this pawn first and then come back and take that pawn. So either way, I get both pawns. So uh, let's see. She played king h1 here. I uh, went h takes g3 and then she resigned. So uh, I won this game, and as a result, I ended up in a tie for um, third through fourth place. Also, I was very happy with my play in this game, I think. Well, except for that one blunder in the opening. So after after move five, my play was uh, good in this game. It was this one place here where I played knight c6 and allowed c4. So after that, from move six forward, I played a pretty good game. Let's go back to the end. Um, so I was happy with that. Um, and uh, I got $150 in my share of third through fourth place. Um, the two players that finished first and second or tied for first through second were actually the two kids I talked about. So they won both their games. Uh, the two players that I played in round two and round three uh, won their final round game and ended up sharing uh, first place. They got $500 each. So pretty decent uh, uh, weekend bonus for the two kids. Um, and, you know, I think uh, overall my tournament performance was pretty good, although you know, given given the number of mistakes, I have to say I still feel like I'm not quite ready to play in uh, Class A somehow. <laughs> there's, there's, there were just too many mistakes that uh, stronger opponents would have punished. So, uh, but at least uh, I can hold my own in uh, Class B. It seems like, and, and actually I did gain some rating points. I gained about uh, 20 rating points in this tournament. So anyway, that wraps up this uh, tournament coverage. Hope you guys enjoyed it, and I will see you all later.